Hey, this is Dr. Mike Carberry with another episode of AMI Today, and we have an old friend with us, a good guest that we've had on many times before who spoke at some of our conventions, Dr. John Rosa. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me again. Good to see you. Good to see you. I want to give some of our listeners who might not be as familiar with you uh, a little bit of your background. I'm going to need your help with that as well, but you're former chair of the board of New York Chiropractic College, and now you're chair emeritus. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. And and you're also currently the chair of the New Maryland, Maryland University of Integrative Health. <laughs> there you go. You're also a surrogate on the White House task force on the opioid crisis. Yeah. And you've been that for a few years um, and you've had briefings and meetings and you've contributed to those briefings and meetings on trying to solve this terrible crisis, which continues and even has been magnified during this whole opioid crisis. Um, you've also been the, uh, the team uh, doctor for the hockey team in Washington, correct? Yeah, yeah we're, well, we, we do a lot of college, professional, Olympic level athletes. We're lucky enough in our local area, we've had some hot spots with great teams. Like we work with the Nationals too. So you got the Nationals who won the World Series. And do, you then, have, do you have the ring? Uh, I don't <laughs> have it. I should have had it on. There you go. <laughs> Um, yeah, but that's all, that's all, that's the fun stuff, right? So we break our, break our minds and our own backs working with patients consistently, but then you have that, the interludes of fun. The opioid crisis and this COVID crisis is definitely not, not fun. fun. But, well, you also run several integrated practices in the Washington DC area. How many do you have? Yeah, we're just opening another one now. So it's going to be 17, 17 practices. We have med, chiropractic, PT, behavioral medicine, acupuncture massage therapy and a few, um, lifestyle medicine is being brought in now to a couple of locations in a certain socioeconomic area. So we're, yeah, we're, we're busy collaborating as many things as we can. So we heard about you a few years ago and you heard about us and it was like an instant attraction because we both have very, very similar goals and paths in life. And uh, we thought it would be good for us to collaborate. That's what integration is all about, working yeah. together in an integrative fashion. So you started coming to our conventions and, and briefing our, our clients and um, by far was one of the most popular speakers we've ever had at any of our conventions because of the data you bring, even though it's very solemn and very heavy, it's just very much needed. And you've become a hero for a lot of our clients because you're a voice we have in Washington. And uh, I'm glad to have you back on the show and people are waiting to hear from you. Yeah, well, I greatly appreciate that. And let me tell you, I mean, this is nice because I get to see your, your face and it's nice to see people. Yeah. But man, I miss those conventions. You put on what a show, not even just the show of it. It's the power, the energy, the speakers, the detail, the, the information, the ability to succeed. I mean, the check off the box on why you want to show up. Oh, I right. love it. I can't right, wait right. to do it again. Yeah, we're looking forward to it as well. But unfortunately, the way the times have been for the last eight months or nine months, we haven't been able to do it. So yeah. it'll come back. We just started doing our tr live trainings because we can keep the it contained. Sure. So we're doing it at our clinic in Chattanooga during COVID. Um, we actually acquired the space next door and turned it into a training center with a classroom and monitors and everything else. So that's, that's been working out very well. That's um, awesome. But I know you've been very busy and I know you've been, there's, there's a lot of things that have been happening during COVID, which haven't really hit the media, even stuff up to today. Yeah, literally. I mean, look, we, we are so, we were have been for several years if we, going into two decades of the opioid crisis i mean how much we've heard about it in our fields it's not something we haven't heard seen or felt a lot of the your listeners have seen it before you may have some new ones that know about it but maybe not the core data to it we did actually get a a dent into this crisis from 18 to 19 it's funny how the the shutdowns and covid issues were in march because those are usually the March to March is the is the is our data collection. Um, so 18 to 19 for the first time ever. In fact, I spoke at one of your uh, one of the conventions speaking about how we finally decreased the number of uh, prescriptions written and overdoses. Right. And it was so short lived because the prescription decrease was like your wisdom teeth and little Susie sprained ankle. It wasn't in that cohort of people who really could end up becoming um, dependent slash addicted and moving into that space. Uh, so, and, and then 20, the, the, the numbers from 19 to 20 bumped up 
and at about a four or 5% rate, we had a decrease in 18 to 19 of 4.1%. We had an increase from 19, um, 19 to 20 of 5.2. So it's so, actually it's actually negated all of our, our our benefit and added on. And man, when I tell you the numbers right now, we have the stuff. You know how the Hopkins does their counter with COVID now. Everybody goes right. to the website to see what the we have that internally when we have some controls. The CDC has this stuff that's a counter. It's by county, not really by city state. And counties, because different counties will report differently within and no different than how the election cycle goes, which is another conversation. Um, so so the, the counties report and we're, we're seeing anywhere from 30 to 100% increase county to county. Oh my God. 40 of our 50 states have shown a, a 30 or above increase in overdose deaths. It's just, it's unbelievable. It really is. But if you think about the process though, I mean, how... One of our most vulnerable societal pieces are the ones with the mental health overlay and who in pain doesn't have a mental health overlay when they're in chronic level pain for a long period of time and taking medications that they know don't make them feel very well and they're dependent on them. That right. this, this isolation and mental health, it's not even isolation that we've been in and out of. This has been, if you don't have anxiety and mild depression today, you're almost not human, right? I mean, <laughs> right. You got, you can't, you, we don't have masks on right now because we're not it's in a room where we have to be six feet apart, but societally, the, the virus in itself, where you're looking around and you don't even, you can't see this thing. It's punching in the face every day. Right. Then you have strife in the streets, which makes the angst level of people is, is through the roof. Right. You have an election cycle that no matter who you were for or with or against, it is a, it's still a very difficult thing. It's, it's yeah. in, still in the midst of being a very divided country. You have the West Coast is on fire. The Gulf Coast is underwater. I'm like, pretty soon kittens are gonna be falling out of the sky. When, when, is there anything else we can talk about that's good news? I just, it's not okay. Right, it's not okay. I, I, you know, it struck me really in the face. Um, we just moved to a new house in Marco Island and we still have a house in Naples and it's in a gated community and it's a lot of seniors over there. And I went over to pick some stuff up at a house last week and I, all my neighbors came out, like they all saw me and they all came over all one at a time. And I'm like, well, I'm a pretty popular guy. Well, no, I was a different face that they haven't seen for a while and they wanted right. to talk. And as I talked to them, the first question to everybody was, how was Thanksgiving? And this is the most common answer I got. Eh, it was okay. It wasn't the same without the kids. It wasn't the same without the family. And even though Florida is pretty open, yeah. the people can't travel. You know, a lot of people from New York, New Jersey, and Chicago that live in that area and their families can't travel down. You know, going back to New York, I understand they have to go into a quarantine or some ridiculous yeah. thing. Yeah. And um, they were all depressed. I'd say 90% of the people I spoke to were depressed. And think, think about what that does. Look, we know in our line of work, we know we have this pilot light of inflammation that's on all the time thank god yeah. because inflammation actually destroys the bad things that are come around or help in repairing some damaged tissues and so the pilot light is on and it should be but what turns the pilot light on to a systemic inflammatory response that we then have an increased susceptibility to the perception of pain well bad eating habits we know yeah. that yeah. lack of sleep we know that yeah. stress and anxiety, Oof, turn that baby on, we know that. So we're all in this heightened inflammatory state waiting to do some extra gardening because we're home and we can't go to work. We right. change our environment, we're sitting at a, on our bed, on the couch, at our kitchen table, at our dining room table, your body's not used to the difference that occurred from your work environment. Like you can check off about 500 things that have changed and that have made us more susceptible then we have some symptoms. And then you, you go online. They, you know they loosened the ability to get prescriptions for opioids in a telehealth visit? They, they, it used to be only for certain cases and you had to have an established patient who you've seen before and you know and understand who they are and what their habits are. You can prescribe it through a telehealth right. visit. They wash those out. You don't even to ha have to ever had seen that patient and you could get on a video call and have get a prescription sent to the to the pharmacy 
who then will no longer need to have an in-face like pickup of the pills because they're it's required normally. Now they'll deliver it to your house because they've taken these restrictions out because of COVID. So we have a, a such a susceptible society based on everything that's going on. And now we have a telehealth visit because somebody sprained their ankle or wrenched their back, pulled, like doing a gardening outside or the project they didn't get to for 10 years. I had a guy come in the office. He was like using a chainsaw and the tree fell the wrong way and he fell backwards, landed. I'm like, chainsaw? I'm like, when's the last time you used that? I'm like, geez, 20 years ago is when I bought it. Like, right. you don't, we don't realize what people are actually doing. Right. And then right. adding the mental health stuff, like you said, Thanksgiving. I mean, this is stuff... When you add this together, it's called susceptibility. That's How right. do we not have our numbers going up by 30 to 100% county to county? Then there's no relapse of part. That's people who are getting the scripts. What about those who said, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. The, the controls to that are what you have based on who you know. So either you're going to meetings like the AA type meetings, or you're, you've got your support system in place that is right there for you to get you over those mental health, those triggers that might get you to, to use again. Now, all of a sudden, you can't see anybody. You don't go to meetings. All those things are there. You're getting more depressed. That super highway of the trigger that makes you want to use, which is, is a disease process, not even like this is your choice anymore. It right. fires off like nobody's business, and you go find. The one thing that you will find during COVID is a drug dealer. They don't, they didn't take off. Right. <laughs> I never even thought of that, but you're right. They're not. I, I was getting gas just yesterday in, in Clearwater to drive down here. And I looked over and there was a drug dealer working, a couple guys coming up and I'm like, okay, sure. time to get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, another dangerous piece to that is they're using alone. So this Narcan thing, the only reason we saw that tiny help from 18 to 19 that I discussed earlier it yep. was a slight decrease in prescribing habits, but that Narcan had a 486% increase in distribution that year. Really? That means that many more of those that they were now prescribing anything over 15 to 20 days of opioid pills. There was a combined prescription for Narcan. Really? Yeah. So is that just a pill? Well, Narcan, it could, it's a nasal and injectable. It's a, it's a reversal for overdose. So, so somebody has to be there. If you overdose, somebody yeah, has to be there and give it to you. Very, yeah. And, well, and if we're all isolated and we're doing this on our you, own. Yeah. Well, how, how, how are you support? It's not going to stop you from using, but it stops right. somebody else from helping you. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's terrible. true. It is terrible. So tell me what's going on. I mean, like how bad the stats have increased. They've gotten worse. We've heard that. Yeah. Um, are we making any headway at all? Is the government addressing this at all? Or is it just too many? Well, I gotta tell you, the it? government has been in such a, a, a whirlwind of paying attention to a lot of other details for obvious reasons that this kind of, and if you notice how the information coming out of the White House and, and, and Senate and, and, uh, and the House has been ramped up during the process from 1819, because that's when they declared this like a national emergency. Trump went in and put money allocated toward it. We had our summit, which I was part of. And, you know, we went full force from 18 to 19. And then 19 to 20 and 20 into 21, an election cycle comes through. So I think there was, a, and, and COVID is the real reason that the punch in the teeth is, is that you have to have all hands on deck for a whole nother thing. So yeah. it, it's not that they're not, continuing to do stuff on it. It's just the, the foot came off the gas a bit. Um, it's kind of idling. It's not, the car is not off, but right. you're not really moving forward that well. And it will turn. Well, when COVID's done, you're gonna start to see the unveiling of two things. One, the opioid crisis and how bad that really is. And I am so sick and tired of the AMA and they're on some of these calls. They have a representative from the AMA. And if I got to hear one more time that they say, well, the illicit drugs like fentanyl is really driving this, the illicit drugs like fentanyl are really driving it. You know me when I get a chance, when that ropes that it's double Dutch, I got two ropes going and I'm standing there waiting, waiting to jump in so I can get my chance to say something. <laughs> and when I do, I'm all in and I'm, I'm, I'm going. And it's, you guys don't understand, no one ever starts with fentanyl. Right. You can't. 
because one grain kills you. So don't tell me that it's that problem because 80% of heroin users started with a prescription medication. That means that little white paper has a trail of people moving into a space that kills them. It's and, unreal. And where's the fentanyl coming from mostly? Most of it is made in China. But Wait a minute, isn't that where not, they made the virus? Yeah, they're, they're making a lot over there. Well, look, yeah, look, they've been trying to get rid of us as a world power for a long time. That's a whole nother political conversation. We won't go into that. We'll be healthcare. We can have that one. Yes. Um, but yeah, they're producing it. And it, the, the, the amount of money you could make from fentanyl is unreal. I mean, it's just like, it takes, you could make $5 million, $4.9 million street value to one kilo of fentanyl, where it's $150,000 worth of, for heroin a kilo of heroin. So if you're a dealer and you can make 150 grand off this brick of heroin, but you can make 4.9 million off of this brick of fentanyl, who, who do you think's pushing what? I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's what, it's so easy too. I mean, I, right. I lecture for the, for Homeland Security, the FBI, DEA, Postal. I was at a fentanyl conference and asked to put on the prevention side on the medical team. And I put together a panel and we were there and the way they describe what happens, how it comes through, even JFK has like 70% of all the packages that are international go through JFK because they have the equipment that can scan and do all that. Right. And I remember one of the guys saying that there was a box of uh, pens that was damaged and the dog sniffed out the box and they open it up and the you know how many boxes of pens come from China every day? Like you probably ordered for your clinics. Pens. Right, right, probably. You know, everybody, who, who doesn't order bulk pens? And the inside, instead of ink, was the tube was just filled with fentanyl. But that, that one pen with that tube could take out 10, 20 people, maybe more, maybe 50 wow. people. But the whole box is filled with a couple thousand pens. So they'll ship a container or a, a, a thing of a hundred of those boxes, they'll only use one of them as the stuff that has it in it. And it's sitting dead center. You got to imagine that they don't go through and they're not opening every single box, checking everybody. They do these, these quantity checks. So if there's a, a container that's coming on a ship or something that comes through by mail, by air, they'll take a hundred units and test two out of the hundred and the percentages are just there. They'll, you know how many times it gets through? And then forget about the porous border, even though we've done a better job at keeping an eye on our south, southern border, the cartels, the, the, the Mexican cartels that are in cahoots with now the Chinese cartels who then just shift it there and say, you guys get it through. Wow. So yeah, it's a continued nightmare. And it, it, it's that, that's kind of gotten easier because the supply and the demand issue, nothing, nothing happens without demand, right? Right. So we created right. a pretty massive demand. Heroin production and distribution increased by 400% since like 2010 to now. Wow. Why? No one was using it. Oh, well, now they, they are all using it because they're jumping from pills that don't work anymore or too expensive and they right. go to a cheaper version. So, and that, that, that is the exact reason I had a family member got on it because they, it was cheaper to get the heroin and they were put on a prescription and boom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. So, the, I mean, are we doing anything about it? Like you mentioned, there's a, a conference going on right now. Yeah, right. It's funny that it's literally, I was on a call this morning, which it, it's usually every Tuesday or one, a Tuesday or Thursday in the middle of the month. And this morning was the call and they were like, well, they showed up today. Two of the Sackler uh, family members were subpoenaed for the House Oversight Committee to have a conversation about their role because every, the pointing the fingers and everything, how they kind of skated out all this stuff about the company going bankrupt and five billion that was going to be taken out. And it ended up being such a nominal like slap on the hand to them financially. Um, and now, because they, their stuff comes up all the time. They have videos of them in meetings and how they're, what they were doing and saying and pushing. And then right. they invented a, an overdose, uh, I mean, the treatment, the, the, the addiction treatment drug, buprenorphine, a form of, came out of their shop. And they have a slide that showed full service pain management prescribed dependency addiction treatment 
It's on a slide that they had in a freaking meeting at Purdue. Yeah. I mean, really? I mean, so so now today they're actually probably buttoned it up because I think it was supposed to be through 12 o'clock today that these guys are having the conversation right now. And then the AMA, you know, you got to, I, I hope and pray that there's still, we, in the meetings, we do have comment and, and we, we have cause and, and precaution, but it doesn't mean the surrogate team is, gives information so that they can decipher what to do and how to do it to an extent. Most of the decision process in the government are really made and a surrogate team is almost like a check to say, we consulted with our experts. Right. Yeah, you did, but did you listen to your experts? That's, right. that, that's a different door. So the surrogate position is literally a little bit BS. It's the fact that I am there, that I weasel my way in and get in front of congressmen and senators and get a chance to speak to the right people. And that's where I have my effect because I'm part of the team, because the team I think is a check and balance sometimes. So the, the, other, the AMA's ability to turn around and say, we need more prescribing through telehealth because people aren't getting access to stuff. More prescribing through telehealth. More prescribing through telehealth. The, but, meaning, and for, for our listeners who don't know. The yeah, things for, that are restricted, right? So, so right. telehealth is prescribing anyway. Like if you say you have like sinus pain and headaches and I got congestion and what color is your sputum and the red, I know that I can get a, an antibiotic prescribed and that's fine. I mean, do you really need me to come to the office? I get it. But if I'm like just had a, a, an injury or an exacerbation of a chronic condition and I am in a lot of pain and you're talking to me, you're allowed to prescribe that the, the things that were not. So the difference is they're pushing for things to be prescribed over your computer that were not able to do before. And they out of the corner of the mouth, they say, well, this is because things like treatment drugs for addiction are not a, we're, we don't have enough doctors certified to do this and they can't go to the office like they're supposed to. So we need to be lenient on our telemedicine requirements so that they can get it. And that's the first line. Then the rest of all they talk about is how there's pe people in pain who are not, are not getting the medication. We have to be able to just prescribe it to them. The, 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 they don't have to show up in person to pick up the prescription let the pharmacist deliver it to their home. All these restrictions that have always been in place, they're trying to lift them. They were lifted, by the way. That's already done. They did that in March. Right. Now right. it expired. I think it expires now, like the end of the year. It's, it was March through December. So now they're pushed right now. Like this is happening literally this week. They have now an entire position paper through the AMA to put this through the entire 2021 period where they don't have any restrictions on writing opioids over the- Unbelievable. Now, what most people don't know before our listeners start blaming the, the doctors for this is historically the AMA has a very low membership rate. Um, numbers that are less than 8% membership, not enough to even generate the dues to sustain the organization, but they're a very powerful, rich organization and how they get powerful and rich. Well, Every doctor I've ever spoken to that I've asked, are you part of the AMA? The answer I get is typically this. Nope, that's the drug companies. So they're funded by the American Pharmaceutical Advertising Council, it I believe. Literally is. It, it, and it, and so they're their a fund. front group. Those are a front group trying to look like they're doctors caring for people, but really they're drug companies caring for their constituents, yeah. their investors, their bottom line. And it's disgusting. It really is disgusting. Mike. Sadly enough, and the deeper I get into the deep state of things, everyone is a front for the pharmaceutical company. That's what you incredible. just said is obvious in the AMA because where do they get all their money when nobody participates or pays dues? Right. What about the FDA? Right. If you don't think the FDA is a front runner, a, a front for the pharma companies, and we we're not, we, no one knows the history of the FDA. I mean, the FDA started as a goof to take a look at medications and there was thalidomide that was being tried to be accepted in the United States. And the woman who was pushing, so it wasn't even the FDA yet. She was like, no, we need more work. We need more information. We need more information. That company that was making thalidomide paid off a bunch of people in the United States to go after her saying, tell her with, in the administration to just shut up so we can push this through. Right. She was persistent to nobody's business. Turned out what, you know, what children of thalidomide look like. Yeah. So she stopped it. And as a result, they created this place 
called the FDA, where they can evaluate things before they go to market. Now, there was a group before the FDA, and it was called the Bureau of Chemistry by Dr. Wiley. And this has gone back 100 years. And his goal, goal was to purify our foods and get all the toxic chemicals out. And they did the same thing to him. They basically, through political pressure, forced him into retirement. And then the next guy coming in said, there's no evidence that food can affect your health. So, Yeah, no, they, they'll creep in where they can. Anytime you have the financial backing of these, of people like the Sackler family, it's, so the FDA then, what they did was they set it up, but they didn't fund it beyond the employees. So they, their ruling was, well, if you want to put, if you want us to investigate your medication, you have to fund the investigation. Well, wait a, wait a minute. So, because the federal government doesn't have enough money? <laughs> I, so this still goes on. Right. So if I want to get my next opioid through, I fund it through you. So, so basically everybody who works there is reliant and beholden to the fact that most of the money that funds the FDA is coming from the industry that's trying to get them to say it's okay to use. Whatever. Right, exactly. You know, it's the same thing with the, um, you know, I, I could actually be, committing heresy by saying this in some people's eyes, but I'm not so excited to get that COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Yeah, and, well, uh, I mean, there's layers of why you're saying that is right. Look, that's a personal thing. So whatever your decision is to do, you're probably right. That's right. But that's but right. also, the, if you look at why you should, it's a public health issue. If right. you look at why you shouldn't, it's your personal health issue. That's right. So, so, you know, I, I'm, I don't disagree with anybody's decision, and, but I, and I respect the reasoning behind either one yeah but because you just don't what you're saying is tying to what we're talking about if the right. reason you're even saying that is because you just you just don't there's a lack of trust in that world that goes so deep and the, and in our profession and our expertise and what we do our our your book i mean read if, if if any of your listeners haven't read that book they should not read it once they should read it three times and buy 10 so they can hand it out to people they know because you dove deep into what the BS is behind yeah. the system. You know what, you wanna hear something funny about the book? I, uh, I was speaking to an attorney in Arizona and he says, are you Mike Carberry, the author? And I'm like, the author? Nice. And he goes, you wrote a book called The Death of American Healthcare? Actually I did. And he said, your stats are so well footnoted. I use that as a reference in court cases. Yeah. I'm like, really? <laughs> That's an, I love when that light bulb goes off and you get, cause look, it's hard work, man. And it, it it's we need to pat ourselves on the back sometimes because to dive into that thing i mean i had a chapter in the book and then we have i have my own nonprofit that you know with the opioid crisis and you know with all the 17 clients managing i got my my main associates on maternity leave i sit on three different boards i have two companies coming after me to give expertise and advice to them my i have a beautiful wife three children i don't have time to like so yeah when somebody says Hey, is that you who did that? Oh, God, like, <laughs> wow, somebody actually saw what I did. <laughs> right, right. So, so tell us, you mentioned the uh, nonprofit, and I yeah. know that the COVID threw a wrench at you there, but we, you were getting some traction. Tell us where we're at with that. Yeah, I mean, for, for those who, may, who don't know, I had started Overdose Free America is, uh, is the nonprofit. And it was all behind this whole mess because the, 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 the more I dove in, the more I realized that prevention is not being done in a way where there's two, everyone hearing and listening to it. It's these pockets of people like in our profession and some others that, so I said, it, the only way to stop it is to make people aware at a, at a higher level and over millions of people, not a few hundred thousand or 10 or a hundred. Uh, when you look at the people who are putting messaging out there at the opioid crisis, each pocket, there's some great content, but each one only has a small pocket of followers. So there's not a, a not large enough awareness campaign done. So I had spoke to the Russo brothers who were the producer directors of the Avenger films and the hottest commodity in Hollywood right now. And I'm friends of the family with them. And we kind of joined together to, to put together this kind of a program where it's a it's like a PSA style thing of a movie trailer of a movie that really is never going to get made, but the trailer explains the whole thing in detail. And then combined with that, the, a song that would have been put out there to get done with uh, Cara Diaguardi, who is the sing the, uh, she's one of the most prolific songwriters for just about everybody on the planet, like Pink and Hootie and you name it, she's written for them. We actually had the song written 
I think the last time we spoke, we were saying how exciting it was. We're getting th things in place. And blah, blah. then this punched us in the face. We were scheduled to be in Nashville to tape the song at, in a studio uh, the week after um, St. Patty's Day. And that's when like literally oh, everything Bruce. got shut down. That's right. Um, and she's been trying to see if we could do like an in-house studio production of it, but what we're doing with that song is some of the people singing some of the lyrics are actually musicians or, or, or talent that have passed away from an overdose. With this digital technology, we can actually bring them in to do so. A lot of your viewers know about what I'm working on for those who don't. So it's really cool. On the film side, we're bringing people into the, into the actor actress side who have passed. And on the music side, we're bringing people who, who were, I mean, God, the list, Tom Petty, um, you know, Michael Jackson, you can unveil about 500 people who've passed of an overdose. So it's difficult to tape and record in an in-house studio and have it prepared to be able to accept this dubbing in of the type of stuff we're working on. So we really just kind of like hit the brakes. Yeah. Um, I did recently a thing with uh, Bobby, uh, this guy, the guy who did Doctored, he was a documentary. Yep. Uh, he's doing a new one now with the veterans and the VA and how I saw that practice and, and, and there might be somebody else involved in that as well that, you know, you. So yeah, we, we may be involved in that. We're not quite sure yet, but um, they have approached us. So we're looking yeah, to do it's that. It's an interesting piece. It really, it's done very well, uh, very well. really highlights the military and it, it's, it's, it, it's integrative medicine approach to helping um, active and people who've come back that have been, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a high level piece. I've, I'm interviewed in it. So I'm actually in, I saw that. in the I documentary. Saw. So I'm excited about that piece too. Yeah. So yeah, there's all kinds of stuff between some documentary stuff, trying to keep filming, doing things with people like yourself who, you know, have people following it and want the information, trying to get that nonprofit work still steady and moving ahead and doing some fundraising and, you know, just keep, you got, you, you, you never fall backwards, you fall forward. And yep. I'm tripping, I'm tripping every day. <laughs> and it's good. It's good to know that you are still pushing forward. Uh, you know, we're both moving in a similar direction and we, I feel like we're, we're two brothers of different mothers and yes, uh, exactly. moving, moving forward and trying to change healthcare in a better way so people yeah. can improve their lives. And, yeah. um, well, I'm glad well, to know I, you. And, I want to heartily thank you for what you're doing because I've been at your events and I know you're still growing and you're going to make such a massive impact by making people better and delivering the right type of health care that, you know, regardless of how things go on my end, I'm so proud to be associated with you. I just want to make sure you know that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that a lot. And it's likewise because what you're doing and the fact that you actually have a line into the White House, um, you know, it's really good to know. And that line, you know, you helped us on a couple of things with that. So um, it's good that we're together because together we're stronger. Yeah. So, right, so Dr. John Rosa, thank you so much for being a guest on our show. Um, if you haven't seen Dr. John Rosa before, look, go online and Google uh, Dr. John Rosa and the White House uh, Task Force on drug on, on opioids. And you can see him actually testifying to the group. And um, you can also probably get a lot more information about him as well, looking at our old interviews and websites. So, John, great to see you again. Can't wait until we can actually shake hands and give a hug. Yes, yes. Happy holidays to you, my friend. You too. You too. Right. And enjoy shoveling that snow. Yeah, hello. <laughs> <laughs> see ya. Take care. Bye-bye.